Hi again, everyone, and welcome to lecture three. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, basically the title of the lecture is a crash course in grammar and style. And so, and we're going to be doing a whole lot of different things. Uh, but uh, this is a lecture that I, I wish someone had provided me uh, when I was in first year university, simply because in high school, I, I remember, we, I think we had like two weeks of learning grammar, and that was in grade 12, I believe. Like it, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. So I want to give you the, the, the groundwork for simple things such as commas and uh, sentence structure, really simple stuff like words you should never use at the beginning of a sentence. I know it sounds silly what I'm saying here, but it's amazing how using a certain word at the beginning of the sentence can ruin the entire structure of, of, of your expression. You, you'll see what I mean. So, um, and then there's going to be tips that I'm going to give you. So some of the things I'm going to talk about today will be rules, like hard and fast rules, and we will be grading you on these things. But then there'll be other things that are more style. So obviously, each of us has our own style. You'll be, you feel free to use whatever, you know, whatever you use. But but utilize some of the things I'm trying to show you. Again, I've done this for so many years. I just noticed the same mistakes are made over and over again. There's, there's about 10 common mistakes when it comes to first year university writing. And I'm not exaggerating. I, I, I notice I have to correct the same 10, maybe 15 things on so many papers. So if you just follow along, I think I can help you with qu quite a few of those. All right. So. Let's begin with a word, and I'm not joking, okay? One word, and that word is clause, C-L-A-U-S-E. What is a clause? So again, let's slow down. If you need to pause and go back, do it, but, but make sure you understand this, okay? A clause is simply a group of words. That's it. Notice what I didn't say. I did not say that it's a sentence. A clause is simply a group of words. I think that. I think that. That's a clause. It's obviously not a sentence, but it's a clause. So let's start with that because, because I'm going to get into more sophisticated stuff in just a second. So a clause. A clause. There is the. Okay, that's a clause. <clears throat> now, it's obviously not a full sentence, as I said. There's a term that we have for that. I'm going to show you. So we'll start with a clause, a group of words. That's it. Highlight, highlight just a group of words. That's a clause. Okay. Now, there are different types of clauses. Okay. So let's keep in mind, okay, or so, like I said, let's keep it simple for now. But yeah, there's different types of clauses. So as I said, a clause equals a group of words. And my example there is a great player. Okay. Now, if that was the clause that I was using, that would be known as a dependent clause. Simple, simple. If you are still a dependent, okay, then that means you rely on, you know, your caregivers, parents, whatever, okay? You don't stand on your own, okay? So dependent. So a dependent clause is simply some words that don't, don't create a full sentence. They don't stand on their own. <clears throat> and so, there's lots of ways we can use those, as, as, as we'll see as, as we go along. Now, an independent clause, on the other hand, it makes total sense, right? If you're independent, you stand on your own. So let's keep it simple, all right? An independent clause would simply be a proper sentence. That's the best way of saying it. It's the most simplistic way of saying it. So you have a, an independent clause, full sentence, okay? Wayne Gretzky is a, is a great, great player, okay? But then I could also add, and watch what I do here, Wayne Gretzky is a great player, not the greatest skater. Okay, see what I did there? Now, not the greatest skater doesn't stand on its own. That's not a complete sentence. So that would be an independent clause. How do we join the two? With the dreaded semicolon, okay? That's really the only time you should ever be using semicolons colons, unless you really understand how to use them. And I will, I, I will watch for that in, in your writing. In high school, I know you were taught, well, whenever in doubt, throw in a semicolon. <laughs> That's not the best rule. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'll talk about that, I think, later on in this lecture, okay? But that's how that's how clauses work. Sometimes they don't stand on their own. Sometimes they do. There's other way we can join independent clauses, by the way. That was just one quick example, okay? All right. And that's it. 
That's that's all you need to know. Just differentiating between dependent clauses and independent clauses because of some of the stuff I'm about to do now. Okay, are we ready? Good. So let's start with commas. Basic. Five things you got to know. Okay? And by the time we finish with this, there's really only four. And if you are if you are confused by the time we get to the end of this component of what I'm about to do, then there's one thing you should always avoid. I'm going to show it to you. What I've always found when it comes to writing, you you're better off not getting too sophisticated if you're not sure. You're better off not making mistakes, okay, and being simplistic than making mistakes because you want to be sophisticated. So let's see how we let's see how we can avoid a lot of the pitfalls that many writers face in first year university. Like I said, if you had difficulty in high school, I'm trying to show you now how we can fix all those things. So let's start with the five comma rules, very simple, okay? Well, as I said, four of them are very simple. One of them is very complicated, but that's the one that people get in, into trouble, okay? Uh, all right, so the very first one you should know, and I'm, I don't wanna get too sophisticated. Again, don't email me Don't email me saying, but couldn't we also do, like, yes, I'm aware of those things. I'm trying to simplify the writing process so that you don't make mistakes. The first rule is comma before the word but. Now, you should have your notes in front of you, right? 2A, comma, space, but. Notice the word but is lowercase, small b. That means that it's not at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, by the way, you should re never really start a, word, a sentence with the word but. But it means it's somewhere in the middle of the sentence. So now let's think about that for a moment. You'll notice in the notes, yes, it's true. It's what we call a conjunction. Don't worry about that. I won't test you on terminology. I, I don't care. All I want you to know is how to write a sentence, how to punctuate. So we have the word but, okay? Let's watch what I do now. So I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, and, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. Notice everything is going smoothly in one direction. But notice what I did there? If we're using the word but properly, then you're suggesting a shift in thought. You were talking about one thing, but now you're talking about something else. So think about that for a moment. The comma is not there for the writer. Much of punctuation is not there for the writer. It's there for the reader. It's to guide, like a really good writer will guide the, the reader along. Okay. I don't know if I said that correctly. A really good writer will guide the reader along. And we do that through punctuation and other things as well. Certain words, you know, transitional words and all of that. So there's your first rule. If you ever had that word, but in the middle of a sentence, it should be, sorry, 99.99999 times out of 100, it will be preceded by a comma. The only exception, and it's right there in your notes, is if we were to say something like, uh, everyone but John went to the store. Okay. In that case, you wouldn't. But I would argue not too many of us would ever say that or write it. We would probably say everyone except John went to the store. That's it. There's your first rule. Pretty simple. Next rule, and I think most of you know this, when writing out a series, sometimes uh, people think of this as a list. Technically, list, it's funny, a list is usually associated more with technical writing than it is with prose, but, but it's the same idea. So, Let's look at our, the series because I chose these words very, very carefully. I like apples, comma, oranges, comma, peaches, and cream. So now this is where we get into a, an interesting use of punctuation because there's a couple of things. Some of you, I know the answer. You know the answer already, I know. Now, let's just say, I want to give you a quick example of how we can get into trouble if we don't punctuate correctly. Let's say I wanted, I worked in a grocery store and I order stuff, you know, to bring into the store. And I wanted a thousand cases of all of the things that I've written out there. Okay, so if uh, English is not your first language, you may not catch what I'm doing here. But there was a possibility if I if I ordered okay, I want a thousand cases of apples, oranges, peaches, and cream. Well, you see now we can get into trouble because there's two different possibilities, two different possible outcomes. I might end up with a thousand ca cases of apples, thousand cases of oranges and a thousand cases of peaches and cream, which if you don't understand the phrasing is corn. Peaches and cream can sometimes be seen as a type of corn. 
if you ever in the grocery store next time you're there if you ever see corn you'll actually see that there's the niblets like the yellow ones but then there's also a mixture of peaches and cream anyway my point being if you don't punctuate that correctly you could get into trouble so in fact and i'm going to show you two things here right just watch just follow along not complicated let's say i know that i want 4000 cases okay i want 1000 cases of the 1 2 3 and 4 well, there's two different things I could do here. In fact, I could write I want a thousand cases of apples, comma, oranges, comma, peaches, comma, and cream. So now I've separated peaches and cream. So if you're curious, yes, you may put a comma before the and in that, that phrase simply because it's something called the Oxford comma. And I know some of you were just dying to put up your hand in class and say, oh, I know that, I know that, all right? Yes, it's called the Oxford comma. So my point being, you can put that comma before the word and in a clause like that. But probably better, and I know some of you already figured this out, why not just move the word peaches somewhere else? Why not move it to before oranges or before apples with commas? Then it's very clear to the reader. This rarely will come up you know, in your writing for university, but you never know. Outside, you get a job in the government, maybe you work with inventory or what have you. These are the little things you want to think about. So anyway, so there's your second rule. And again, you all know these things, right? But the only thing to, 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 to remember, yeah, you can put a comma before the end. Okay, and that's it. That's two. Number three, very straightforward, if, if you follow what I'm about to do. When you were a child or when you were younger, you were probably told never to begin a sentence with the words although or because, especially because. Well, in fact, that's not true. You, 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 you can use because at the beginning of the sentence. But there was a reason why you were told not to do that. And the reason was that you can get into trouble in terms of your expression and your grammar, get your punctuation. So notice, let's take a look now at the notes at the bottom of page one. If you're going to start a sentence with a word like although or because, there's a certain way that the sentence then has to be constructed. It has to be constructed, although X, and now what does X signify? Go back up to the very top of page one. X would be a clause, it's some words. And it could be a dependent clause, it could be an independent clause, okay? But it's words, it's a clause. So there's although, and, and then followed by some words, then comma, and then some more words. So it ha the, 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 the sentence has to be set up that way. So although I found the, the, the party to be, to be very, you know, very uplifting, that, <laughs> whatever, comma, right? The, uh, the, the time went by too quickly, whatever, all right? So although X, comma, Y. Same thing with because. Because there are too many uh, chairs in this room, comma, it, it is impossible for us to fit, fit any more, any more students or whatever. Again, those were two terrible examples, but you, but you see what I'm getting at. Although something, comma, and then the rest. One last thing, never, ever, ever begin a sentence constructed with although, comma, don't ever do that. That is incorrect. It's not style, that's incorrect. Okay, it has to be although something, clause, words, comma, and then words, okay? All right. And so it is true, some of you are screaming now, especially if you, you know, if these rules were really grounded into you, that you're saying, but isn't that a passive sentence? Yeah, it is, it is. But there are certain times where a passive sentence will work perfectly. And I'll, I'll give you a little hint right now in a transitional sentence. So although, in, like, if you remember back, if you took a, a quick look at uh, the, in, the paragraph I had on imperialism in lecture two, although imperialism benefited some countries, comma, it was, it was horrible for others. So a transition, right? There's a little tip for your style. When you're writing out papers or whatever for this class or any other, if you ever have a transition, you kind of sum up what you were just talking about, okay, comma, suggest where you're going. Perfect. So that's when a, a, a passive sentence would work very, very, very beautifully. But, uh, but, but obviously, though, you do want to avoid passive sentences for the most part, right? You want to stay in the active. 
again, we're going to get into that today. Okay. Then, okay, number four, we're almost done. We're almost done with all commas you will need as long as you just keep your writing simplistic. Okay. If you're worried about your writing, we're almost done. Number four, introductory words or phrases. Now, notice the way I've written that. Capital I, okay, introductory words or phrases, okay, or whatever, comma. So if we were in class, we, you know, we, we, we could have a bit of fun with that. You know, I, I'd ask you, well, give me some words, give me some words. These are words like, oh gosh, therefore, furthermore, on the one hand, on the other hand, like hundreds, if not thousands of words. Remember, again, why do you include words like that in your writing? Well, what did I just say earlier? You, you, you introduced a word like that, therefore, okay? In other words, you're going to hammer home the point you were making, okay? Furthermore, you're going to add on to it, okay? Finally, comma, right? We're almost done. Not for the writer, for the reader. If you're really good at using words like that, right? Again, you're guiding the reader through your writing. Simple as that. that. That's how really good writing works. So it's almost like words like that, you're giving a roadmap to the reader if you use them effectively. Okay. It's funny. Uh, in I think, I can't remember if it was this class or another, but one mistake I sometimes make, there'll be maybe 15, 20 minutes left in the lecture, and I'll say something like, finally. Well, that, that's horrible, especially. Like students are now thinking we're almost done. So they're not paying attention. Same is true in your writing. I remember what it was now. It was a paper I was marking and the, the, the student was on page three of a five page paper. And at the top of page three said, finally, I understood exactly what the student was trying to do. They were more or less wrapping up what they were just talking about. But to use a word like that makes it sound like we're almost done. Then I kept marking thinking, well, you said we were like, basically, why are you still talking? Right. Do you know what I mean? And but the same is true for me if I said that in class. If I said finally with 15, 20 minutes left to go, you'd start thinking, okay, well, check your email or whatever, Facebook, right? Well, you're usually doing that anyway throughout the entire class that I'm giving. So anyway, all right. So we've got all those words. Now there's a couple of things I want to say about that. So we've got all those words. I've got you've got them there. However, is one of the worst words when it comes to this, as you'll see in just a second. The word however. It's a big one of the biggest style records in the English language. So let's keep it simple. Rule number four, okay, what, what, are we, what are we thinking about? Okay, this, is, this might sound a bit complicated. It's not the one you break it down if you've been following everything else that I just did. If we do it correctly, on the one hand, on the other hand, therefore, furthermore, they are then followed by a comma and they're at the beginning of the sentence. If you do it correctly, what should then come after is an independent clause. I know some of you already caught that, right? So, so the furthermore, therefore, they're not really needed for the sentence, but you include them for the roadmap, for the reader, right? I think that makes sense. So that's really key in understanding how to punctuate uh, you know, certain words or terminology you want to include, right? Think about those things. Now, I'm about to say something. So, so and remember, what follows is an independent clause, a proper sentence. Okay, so so the, the part before the comma, so the comma offsets that word or or clause, right? On the one hand, on the other hand, whatever, offsets it because it's not needed for the rest of the sentence. But you want it in there, as I said, to guide the reader. That's it. That's all you need to know when it comes to the comma. There is one more rule, and this rule is is very complicated. It look it looks identical to rule number four, but it's not. And it gets re it really screws up a lot of writers, okay? Especially when it comes to the word however. So I'm going to do this as, as best as I can because in, like, if we were in class, I'd go like I'd make sure I went through two or three examples showing how I would show I would try and trick you to show you mm -mm, it doesn't work that way. So let's just see the rule, then I'm going to fix it. If you're confused, I'll fix your confusion. Now, rule number five, two e, x. Notice x is capitalized so it's at the beginning of the sentence comma then you have those exact same introductory words or phrases exactly the same as number four then you have a comma then you have y so x is a clause okay group of words 
and y is a clause, a group of words. If I do this correctly, and as I said, you're gonna get, some of you are gonna get very confused. If I do it correctly, and if I put the commas in the right places, I should be able to take the introductory, just mentally, I should be able to take the introductory word or phrase and the commas out of the sentence. I should be able to take X, that clause, and Y, the end clause, put the whole thing together, and it should be a nice, smooth sentence. Okay, sorry, you didn't see my hand there, but it should be like a nice, smooth sentence. So, let me just show you a couple of things here, okay? I'm gonna show you a correct way to do it and an incorrect way to do it. John loves ice cream, chocolate ice cream, comma. However, Jill does not like ice cream on hot days. That is incorrect. Because you see, if I was to take the however out, okay? If I were to take the however out, okay? I, I know, I know, the subjunctive. Anyway, if you've ever seen the Big Bang Theory, there's a, a good clip on the subjunctive. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. If I take that however out and the two commas, just read the sentence. John loves chocolate ice cream. Jill does not like ice cream on hot days. That's not a smooth sentence. That doesn't work. I could show you a thousand ways to fix that, okay? But why bother? If I was to do it this way, Sally, however, thought there were major problems with the proposal. Okay. And like I said, you're gonna be confused, but then in, give me 30 seconds and I'll fix it. Let's take the however and the two commas out. And let's see what happens. Sally thought there were major problems with the proposal. That's fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. Nice smooth sentence. If you are confused, what, I guess what I'm saying here is, can you put those introductory words or phrases in the middle of sentences? Of course you can, as long as you know how to punctuate it. If you're confused here, very simple way of, of cleaning it all up. Let's move the word however to the beginning of the sentence. However, comma, Sally thought there were major problems with the proposal. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Let's go back and fix the incorrect one. John loves chocolate ice cream, period, capital H. However, Jill does not like ice cream on hot days. Now it's correct. So we see now how all this stuff works. Sometimes if you're not sure, if you're not sure, simply put those introductory words at the beginning of the sentence. Now, rule number four, let's not even try to do rule number five if, if we are confused. That's it, that's the comma. Get those words at the beginning of the sentence, followed by a comma, then you know you're right. Okay, could you get more sophisticated by having those words in the middle of the sentence? Sure you could, but wouldn't you rather be right than maybe sophisticated and right, okay? Now, there's gonna be one last question, so don't email. I, I know the question you're already asking. Could you have written in the incorrect one, John loves ice cream, semicolon? Yes, and then however, comma, okay? Yes, you could put a semicolon there, okay? And again, I'll, I think by the end of this lecture, I'll show you. There are times where maybe you could use a semicolon, but there are times where you, you can avoid it and just make a better sentence. I've got lots of examples, all right? Okay, so as I said, we maybe now have now another half hour to go, and um, we will now look at just simple, simple mistakes that, that most of us make, okay? I certainly made them when I was in first year university. I keep telling you that, right? They, I, I, maybe I haven't, but I did not do great in, in my first year of university, right? My grades were, <laughs> they weren't A pluses, I'll guarantee you that. So let's look at, and again, if you, if you just take my word for this and say, okay, I'm never gonna do that again, your writing will improve, okay? We're gonna look at contractions and the possessive case. Boy, if, if we could save so much time we could be done the lect almost today. We could almost be done if you just made a promise to me you will never use a contraction ever again in your writing. We would save so much time.
If does everyone understand what a contraction is? Take a look at your notes under the number three. Don't. Don't is a contraction, okay? We've contracted two words into one, do not into one, with the apostrophe. Do not do that, okay? Why? Take a look at number four at the very bottom of page two. Look at all the possibilities when it comes to words like it's, it's, your, your, whose, whose, there, there, there. Way too many choices, way too many choices. Many people don't even realize that the first one I have beside number four, I-T-S, is a word. I'm not joking. I shouldn't say many, but, but a number of people do not even understand that that's a word. These words, okay, some of them are the possessive case, some of them aren't. So, will you agree with me that you will never use a contraction again? Because if you don't use the contraction, we can get rid of I-T apostrophe S, we can get rid of Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, because I-T-S means it is, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E means you are, whose, okay, W-H-O apostrophe S means who is, okay, and then of course with the there, way too many choices. Get rid of the apostrophes, okay? We only need apostrophes when it comes to the possessive case, all right? So get rid of contractions. Then, if you're talking about something belonging to an inanimate object, I found its contents unconvincing. I found its contents unconvincing, right? Meaning I looked at a proposal or like an, uh, an essay or whatever, and I was unconvinced. If you were to say that I found its contents, it's I-T-S, belonging to it, belonging to an inanimate object. Okay, that's the word you want. So always write it out. If you if you mean it is, write it is. And that way you won't make a mistake. What did I just say with the posture, or with the commas? Okay, if you're confused about number five, eliminate number five. Make sure you always do number four, right? Then you're fine. Same with your, you are, but your, Y-O-U-R, means your book, your house, the house that belongs to you. So when we talk about the possessive case, we mean belongs to, okay? Okay, the contents belong to it, the proposal. That is your house, the house that belongs to you. Whose, 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 whose tablet is that, okay? Okay, who does that tablet belong to? And then finally, there. Well, we're going to get rid of T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. We're getting rid of that in our writing. Now we only have two choices. Okay, we just eliminated. Chances are you're going to want the word T-H-E-I-R almost always. Unless you're talking about something belonging to them. And if you're talking about something belonging to them, then it's there, T-H-E-I-R. That's it. So again, I don't know if I need to go back and repeat, repeat, repeat. Go back, rewind, look at the lecture again. Rewind, should I be using that word? But go back again, see my explanation for all that. The key, don't use contractions in your writing. If you make a mistake with a contraction, I will bust you I, heavily because it's easy to avoid. Easy to avoid. That sounded harsh, I know, but I would rather you improve your writing then simply do the same things you've been doing over and over again. There's a lot of things, a lot of things we have to break when it comes to the way in which we write. Okay. All right. So, as I said, I, I could read off all of number page three at the top, but th there's just too many choices when it comes to contractions versus other things. So know your possessive cases. There's other ways, by the way, that we do use the possessive case when we then do use an apostrophe. So it's not a contraction. So let's just look quickly at, um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at the, like you can read all of the other examples or all the other information that I have there, but just take a look at number five, the apostrophe. So let's just say I was talking about, and the apostrophe signifies in English, not all languages, but in English, the apostrophe, if we use it correctly, will signify quite often possession. So. Just take a look at the word Jones with an apostrophe. It, it, this is going to show, uh, there's a couple of things I'm going to, I'm going to answer again some of the questions that you have. You'll see, okay? Like I said, the same questions pop up over and over again. The same problems pop up over and over again. So, Jones. 
I always get confused when I'm trying to show the possessive case of a word ending in S. No, don't. Okay, we'll, we'll fix that right now. Jones, comma. Okay, I'm sorry, Jones apostrophe. So that would, if I was to use that in a sentence, I might say something like, that is Doug Jones's house over there. So Jones apostrophe. Okay. <coughs> and so the major problem when it comes to this form, it's the possessive case, right? You, I'm sure you all know this, right? So the, the, the problem, though, is when you have, like I said, a word ending in S. So whenever you want to show possession of any word, any word, whether it ends in S or not, just do a mental box around the word, the entire word, whether it ends in S or not. The apostrophe will go outside of the mental box. Don't change the word. So just to give you a quick example here. What if I had put the apostrophe after the E in Jones? Okay, I'm back up to number five now. Had I done that, well then now his name is no longer Jones. I just changed his name to Joan because I put the apostrophe after the E. See what I mean? So instead, draw the mental box around the word, whether it ends in S or not, just don't change the word. Draw a mental box, apostrophe goes outside of the box. Now, there's many different things we could talk about here. Should I include an extra S? Okay. In English usage, we don't. Okay. But, in fact, it is not incorrect to do so. Okay. So, so in other words, if you wanted to show Jones's house, you could have written J-O-N-E-S apostrophe and then another S. But don't do it. Even though it even though it is correct, it, it's not common usage. And so someone if you were writing for somebody else and it, and it was your job or even a, a, a professor, they would say this, they, they might even say it's incorrect. It's not, but it's not common usage. So we don't need the extra S. OK. But of course, if it was something like um, Ricky and then apostrophe S, well, obviously, then you still need to add the S, right? Okay, I shouldn't have said that. I think that's pretty straightforward. Paul, Paul, all right, Paul. Well, then, if that's Paul's book, P A U L apostrophe S. But if it ends in S, just the apostrophe. Yeah, that was better. And so, yeah, if you just take a look at my example there, the whole idea of kittens and everything else, the idea of where we put the apostrophe all depends on the context, right? If I'm talking about one kitten, you know, the, the, the kitten's little playroom, then I would have kitten apostrophe S. If I was talking about a whole lot of kittens and then talking about their play area, then I would have kittens apostrophe, right? Don't change the word. If I only have one, then apostrophe S. If I have a whole lot ending in S, then apostrophe. And that's it. Okay, so there, there you go. There's the two major, I'm not kidding, the two major problems when it comes to writing in, at the first year level, right? Contractions get in the way, the possessive case sometimes people have a problem with, and commas. Those are the major ones. Like, obviously, there's more, but those are the biggies. Those are the biggies. So, like I said, a word like however, boy, that can really get you into trouble if you're using it in the middle of the sentences because it ends up, do, it ends up creating, that some of you may be aware of, something called a comma splice. So, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, okay, don't worry about it. Put your however at the beginning of a sentence. Simple, simple. I wish someone had showed me this stuff when I was in first year. Okay, now we're going to get into a bit more style, right? I think this lecture today might take about 45 to 50 minutes. Oh, we're already at 34 minutes. Yeesh. All right, I talked too much. Okay, so yeah, we can jump quite a bit now on page four, all right? Here's an interesting one. Yeah, this is something uh, you might have come across this when, 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 when reading. And uh, just when you have two possessive subjects, right? if you have two people and they're talking about belonging to in the same sentence, I just found this one interesting. Let's just say there was a car that was shared by Tom and Mary. Okay. And that, sh that, 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 that car had to go in for repairs. You would actually write Tom and Mary's car is in the shop for repair. You wouldn't put Tom's and Mary's car. You would simply put Tom and Mary's, but I'm sure you've come across, you know, sentences where it'll say, you know, Tom's and Mary's. And well, in fact, that could be, that could be correct. 
If there are two cars in question, then you would write Tom's and Mary's cars are in the shop for repair. It's a subtle little thing, but um, I just thought I'd show you that. If, you, if you've ever come across that and wondered, how can they do it that way one way, but not the other? There's your answer right there. <laughs> okay, so now we're getting into style. So many of the things I'm about to say now, okay, they aren't necessarily rules, but they will they will get you into trouble if 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 you if you use if you use them. I'm not saying that really I'm not saying that correctly. If you were to go to another professor, English professor, and say, I started this sentence, and, 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 and Gilday said, well, I shouldn't, okay? Well, the, the other professor might say, no, you can do that. What I'm saying is, but when you do what I'm about to show you, quite often we get into trouble with other things, okay? That, that's all I'm saying. So now we're into the portion of the lecture, okay? We're 35 minutes in. Now we're into the portion of the lecture where some of the things I'm going to say, I'm simply warning you. You really shouldn't do this. But I'm not saying it's a rule necessarily. I don't know if I can be any clearer. Okay, I'm trying to help you with your writing. So let's look at the very first thing here, the very first one. Okay, something known as ing words. Ing words. This is something called a gerund. I'll bet I'll bet half of you know this stuff, but, but many of you probably don't. I certainly didn't before I started teaching all this. What is a gerund? Okay, let's just look at my definition or my warning. Avoid beginning your sentences with words ending in ing, I-N-G, unless they are the subject of the sentence. Let's slow down. What do I mean by that? There are many ing words, knowing, going, having. These types of words are horrible, horrible words to use at the beginning of the sentence, okay? Because they can get, they can create a whole lot of difficulty when it comes to subject verb agreement, when it comes, oh yeah, that's the biggie, subject verb agreement, or modification, okay? I'll give you a quick one right now, all right? And again, don't worry about the answer, because I'm, this will be in another lecture, okay? I think lecture nine, where we start to get really sophisticated. I'm just telling you not to, don't use words ending and ing at the beginning of the sentence unless they are the subject. So let me show you. Having trouble falling asleep, the TV helps 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 me get through the night okay write it down I don't, I don't think i have the example right there no okay having trouble falling asleep the tv helps me get through the night in fact if you were to write the sentence the way that i just said it it's the tv that's having trouble falling asleep i know that doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense at all but because we set up the sentence the way we did right with the word having at the beginning it screws up the rest of the sentence I could have easily said instead, or could have written instead, when I have trouble sleeping, okay, now it's very clear. The TV helps me get through the night. So think about think about little things like that in your writing. Just get rid of those ing words, unless they are the subject of the sentence. So I keep saying that. Here's your example. Swimming is an enjoyable activity. Nothing wrong with that, right? Because swimming is the subject of the sentence. So there you go. Okay? So if in doubt, don't start words with ing, okay? Unless they are the subject of the sentence. Don't know how else to say that. Now, the last thing on page four, it, this is an interesting one. I've noticed that writing is really changing, especially when it comes to the internet. So let me let me show you how to be, you know, an effective writer, but then let me, I'll also give you a hint on how you can write for the internet, okay? You see what I mean. Watch out for sentences that begin with it is, this is, that is, Phrases like that, I'm not saying you can't do it, but always be clear what this is or it is or that is if ever there's any kind of doubt. You might have, you might have more than one subject in a, um, in, in, a, in a paragraph, and if you start referring to this, that, or it, it may not be clear which this, that, or it you're referring to, okay? So again, you, little things you want to think about, all right? All right, and I guess that's pretty clear. I bolded all, all the, the words that I'm thinking of there. Split infinitives. Boy, this is where those of you who are real grammarians, who are sticklers, you're, like, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. I really don't care about split infinitives. I think there are far more, more important things to worry about. And in fact, if you 
think you're a grammarian and you want to email me saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. In fact, there's two camps out there right now that have been arguing this back and forth for God's decades, right? There are descriptivists and prescriptivists. There's two schools of thought when it comes to this. So yes, I do know what I'm talking about, all right? I had one, one student who thought they knew everything and wrote me this huge email and uh, I didn't I didn't even bother returning it all right so <laughs> anyway if you're if you're wondering the infinitive right it, it's phrases like to do to be whatever okay and there are many people who would say I'll give you a perfect example I might even have it here okay well here's my one example but I'll give you a better one so he always tries to carefully do the work so uh, a prescriptivist, the hardliners would say, well, no, you shouldn't write that. You should write, he always tries to do the work carefully. Okay. Or yeah, to do the work carefully. But the more famous one, those of you who are Trekkies, right? To boldly go where no man has gone before. To boldly go. So uh, a, a prescriptivist would say, well, really, you should be writing to go boldly. But again, this goes back to the Latin. I'm not going to bore you with the first year course. It all goes back to the Latin. And uh, again, I'm not worried about them. I'm not worried about them. I'm more of a descriptivist. All right. Okay. So there you go. There you go. And if, and if the last minute and a half didn't make any sense whatsoever, don't worry about it. <laughs> Seriously. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Now this, this part of the lecture, I really, I really like. This is punctuation that really should be eliminated from your writing unless you know how to use it correctly. The first one is the semicolon. I already gave you a quick example. There are times where, yes, you can use it, but don't just drop it in when you're not sure what to do. I don't know why, but a lot of high school teachers, they, that's what they tell you. Oh, well, if you're in doubt, just drop a semicolon in there. No. Now, I'll give you a quick example when you think a semicolon might work, and I can just show you very quickly. Well, how can we fix that? Terry, Terry plays hockey, semicolon. Terry plays baseball, semicolon. Terry plays football, semicolon. Terry plays basketball, period. Okay? Well, some teachers would say, well, yeah, the semicolon would work better than periods throughout. So, like, Terry plays football, period. Terry plays baseball, period. Okay? Again, over and over. All right, well, yeah, I guess a semicolon makes it sound like it, 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 it gives more flow. No, it doesn't. That, like, I mean, I don't understand that kind of logic. How about we just rewrite the sentence properly? Terry plays many sports like football, comma, baseball, comma, basketball, comma, and hockey. Perfect. So again, these are the little things that you, you want to clean up your writing. And remember, it, it doesn't happen overnight, all right? I had to work on things like that a, a, quite a bit when I was in first year, okay? Like, literally, I, I was stuck in the same kind of traps that many first year writers are because we're taught these things in high school and they simply don't apply they don't but well i don't even want to get into why it's taught anyway so there's one semicolons if you don't if you use them and you don't know how again i'll i will bust you on that in your writing okay but there's other ways of writing so and we'll get into that as well dashes so that, that this is now we're getting into lazy writing where you have a thought and then all of a sudden, there's another thought that kind of could be added to the sentence that, so you put a dash and you add in that other thought, then you put a dash and then you move on with the rest of the main thought. Don't do that, all right? There's, use commas. <laughs> use comma sense. Um, no, I'm joking. I hate that phrase, common sense. I said comma sense. Anyway, so get rid of dashes when, you know, in, in the body of your writing. Again, lazy writing. Same thing with parentheses in the body of your writing. Obviously, like we already saw in lecture two, when we are, you know, quoting or whatever, parentheses will be used at the in, in the parenthetical note, right? Okay. So, but as I said, in the notes, it simply says these are style wreckers. They they just wreck your style, so, and, and, and it just it just I hate to say it this way, but it really does make for lazy writing. Okay, it just makes for lazy writing. That's all. Okay, there it is, right there at the end of that note. And then yeah, one of my favorites, and this is actually true, what I'm about to show you. When you put a word, when you feel the need to put a word in quotation marks, okay? Not a quote, but you just feel the need to put a word in quotation marks. All right. And there's my example there. 
The reason why so many people feel unfulfilled is because of society. <laughs> oh, my meaning is very clear now, isn't it? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> so here's a little tip. When you, when you feel the need to put a word in quotation marks, right, other than like a quote, maybe you, I've actually read a couple of interesting studies on this. It's your subconscious telling you this is important. This word, for some reason, is important. The minute you feel the need to do that, just find better expression. Like explain exactly what you mean, because it's not self-explanatory. Just because you put it in quotation marks doesn't all of a sudden mean it's self-explanatory. So watch out for that, okay? Yeah, and I'm gonna give you, this is, uh, I'm not kidding, okay? This is actually, this is, this actually happened. My wife is a concert pianist, okay, trained, trained classical pianist. And so she used to give concerts, okay? Very grueling, any of you who are musicians, it can be grueling, okay? Um, but anyway, so one year she gave a Christmas concert and um, eventually uh, uh, she received a note, like a thank you note. So we were cleaning out uh, uh, some drawers one day for, I, I can't remember why, but we were like, like spring cleaning, whatever. And I came across this note, okay? And I swore I would use this in every writing course that I would ever, ever teach from here on in. Here is the, exactly what was said in, in the note. Thank you for the splendid concert and to wish you the best in the coming years. So, that can be taken two different ways. <laughs> it could be taken literally, but it can also be taken as thank you for the concert. It was crap. <laughs> and to wish you the best in the coming year. That's almost a death threat. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm saying is just don't throw words in quotation marks for no reason. All right. All right. There's actually a very funny Chris Farley skit about that as well. I don't think you can find it on YouTube anymore, but it has to do with some some okay uh, i won't get into it but anyway they said i was disgusting <laughs> anyway all right and then yeah a couple of last things I, I figured around 50 minutes don't ever ask questions in your writing okay i'm talking your summaries i'm talking your final research take-home paper whatever don't ask questions all right get to it the reason why i'm saying don't ask questions very simple i'm going to ask a question two things are going to happen one I'll answer the question, which means I didn't need to ask the question to begin with, or two, and worse, you don't answer the question. So now the reader is wondering, well, that was a good question. Why didn't you answer it? Again, don't email me. But in high school, we were told to end our papers with a, no, God, no, 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 no. So eliminate questions in your writing, right? Any form of writing, just get rid of questions, okay? You don't need them. Okay. And again, please do not email me about anything you learn in high school. All right. All right. It just, it, it gets tedious after a while. And so we're almost done. That's what I figured 50 minutes. So one last thing, I'm going to finish the lecture by insulting your intelligence. Okay. And I'm not joking. The word TWO is a number. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can't tell you how many times I've had to fix this. Now, TWO, I know, most of you know that it's a number, but TOO and TO, oh, all of a sudden, that's where the confusion comes in. So basically, when you have T, most of the time you'll want the word TO. I want to go to the store. I want to go to the store, okay? TO, TO. But let's just say, I want to go to the store Two. Okay. Think about it this way. I want to be added on to the group that goes to the store. So when you add on, add on. There, the, the number of students in this room was perfect until someone came in and now there are too many. We added on. So when you add on, add the extra O. That's the, a little thing I came up with. So watch out for that one as well. Okay. Again, what did I say at the beginning of the lecture today? Just 10, 15 common mistakes that everyone makes. Not everyone, but many people make at the first year level that we just want to clean up. So there's almost our last one. And then finally, we'll get into this more. Remember that every sentence, if you're doing it correctly, should have a subject and a verb. 
Every sentence should be about someone or something. And then the verb simply, you know, what about that someone or something? And like I said, we'll, we're going to get into quite a bit of that later on. But let's just let's just finish off with a very simple one, right? John hit the baseball. John, with, without anything else happening, if John isn't in that sentence, well, then the baseball can't be hit. So we need a subject, someone or something. And then finally, the verb hit. Now, the reason why I want to end off with that, if you understand about subjects and verbs, which again, I'm going to show you quite a bit of, uh, then we begin to eliminate things like uh, comma splices and um, fragments and things like that. So anyway, as I said, all I wanted to do today was just uh, clean up a few, a few of the issues that I just happened to have seen over the years that pop up over and over again. Next time, we will be talking, I think, about... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I know what we'll talk about, but um, let's just leave it at that. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. All right. So have a, a, a great day and we will be talking to you soon. All right. Bye.